Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Roberts, and I serve as the Interim Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs at Missouri S&T. And I'd like to welcome you all today uh, for a conversation with a very distinguished guest and friend of S&T, Dr. Sandra Magnus. We're all delighted to have Dr. Sandra Magnus with us today. She's not only a former at NASA astronaut, but a Missouri S&T alumna as well. She earned a bachelor's degree in physics and a master's degree in electrical engineering at Missouri S&T, and then went on to earn a PhD in engineering from Georgia Tech. In 2016, Missouri S&T appropriately named her an alumna of influence, a distinction that only 10 alumni have received to date. Today, Dr. Magnus serves our country as Deputy Director for Engineering in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. She works at the Pentagon. This is the Chief Engineer for Advanced Capabilities, where she leads engineering policy practice initiatives in the engineering workforce for the U.S. Department of Defense. Dr. Magnus joined the NASA Astronaut Corps in 1996, a class she calls the International Space Station Group. She worked with space agencies in Europe, Japan, and Brazil, and traveled to Russia to support hardware testing and operational product development. She flew her first mission to the International Space Station in 2002 aboard the Space Shuttle Atlantis. And returned to the station in 2008 for a four-month assignment as a science officer. On that mission, she made engineering upgrades to the station and traveled over 50 million miles. She made her last flight in 2011 as the primary robotics officer on the final journey of Atlantis, on the mission that closed the book on Atlantis on NASA's shuttle program. For joining NASA, Dr. Magnus was a stealth engineer for McDonnell Douglas Aircraft Company, where she worked on internal research and development on the Navy's A-12 attack aircraft program. With this remarkable background, we are looking forward to the experiences and advice Dr. Magnus can share with us today that may help us adapt to the social isolation and other stresses that have come with the coronavirus pandemic. After Dr. Magnus speaks, we'll have a question and answer period that will run at 3 p.m. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the webinar through the Zoom question and answer function. That's the Q&A button at the bottom of the window. We will address as many questions as we can, but the question and chat function will not be available on the screen. So our first question, Dr. Magnus, in the last month, most of us have had a significant, a significant change to introduce to our lives through the mandate of social distancing. We're adapting to new learning methods, such as switching to online classes, and changes in how we interact with one another. We'd love to hear from you about your experiences in extreme social distancing in space, and your advice for students and all of us who are dealing with this because of the pandemic. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a popular question these days. How do you deal with isolation? And I have to say, we're not really isolated from each other. I think distance is is probably the right word because we do have a lot of connectivity and we're just in this different, different mode of operating right now, right? Um, it's kind of hard, I think, for people to adjust to it. But, um, you know, for example, when I was approaching my space missions, it sort of got this mission mindset. It's like, okay, I'm in this, I'm going to be on the space station. I'm going to be there for four, four and a half months, whatever. This is going to be my lifestyle. And I'm just going to operate within those bounds, um, knowing that that's just the, the circumstances. So I think everyone has to kind of put themselves into that mission mindset. Uh, there are a lot of ways to reach out to people. I'm, I'm sure the students are probably more versed in that than I am, quite frankly. So you're not really isolated. You just, I would say, are in an environment that you don't have as many external distractions and take this opportunity to focus on things that, that uh, you've always wanted to focus on, but you've never had the chance. So it's sort of an interesting environment because it does gives, it gives us new opportunities, even though it's taken away some of, some of our other opportunities. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, is there any parallels between the 
personal social isolation routine that we're going through today and the kind of experience regarding isolation that you experienced in space aboard the station or aboard Atlantis? Yeah, actually, it's kind of funny. Um, I'm sure many of you who are working from home, you know, whether that's students studying or, or people who are uh, professionally employed at home, you probably find that the days are sort of running together and it's hard to remember what day of the week it is, whether it's Monday or Tuesday or, or Wednesday or whatever. You also probably find yourself losing track of time as well. And, and that was very much like it was like on the space station when I was up there. The days of the week were sort of irrelevant. I just kept working off of the schedule that was provided to me by the ground and that the time of the day was also irrelevant because I was just working to the schedule. And so I'm sure everyone's kind of fallen into these routines where you're, you're, you, you lose track of time and you're spending a lot of time working or you lose track of time and you're, you're not studying as much as you should. So I think the important thing is to set up a routine and sort of have some discipline to stick to it. And, and that routine should be balanced. You shouldn't be working 12 or 14 hours a day. You should be balancing the me time versus the, oh, I've got to get this work done time. But it does have that same feel, like when I was on the space station, just from a losing track of the, the days and the hours. Was there any formal part of NASA astronaut training that, that dealt specifically with uh, social isolation and right and the experience of not being part physically of broader social groups no not really I, I think you know it, the I, isolation is sort of relative right we were maybe physically distant clearly because we're not on the planet we were physically distant but I never really felt isolated on the space station because I had the ability to call people, believe it or not. I had a phone that I could, when we had the right comm set up, I could make phone calls. I would get email three times a day. I would get um, the ability to do video conferences with my family on the weekend. So I had two crewmates with me, so I wasn't necessarily isolated. I think, you know, here, what we're experiencing now, of course, is incredibly awkward and very unusual, but you have the ability to go outside. You know, I missed going outside, for example. I couldn't just go outside and take a walk. And so having that ability here. So, so I think one of the ways to maybe adjust to this situation is, is realize that you're not, you're not really isolated per se. You can still do a lot of things that you want to do. You just have to do it with a lot more physical distance from people. But we never really got any specific training on it. Again, it's, it's more a matter of a mindset. You know, I'm going to be in this, I'm going to be in this mode and I've got to figure out how I'm going to operate in this mode. Okay. Um, so as, as NASA's uh, right, uh, vision and capabilities have evolved over, over the years, and, and you've watched that, right, there's always been an element of ambiguity and, uh, ambiguity and uncertainty through the evolution of, of the NASA right, mission trajectory, et cetera. And of course, on any individual mission, maybe in the back of your mind, there's perhaps some ambiguity and uncertainty as well. And I was wondering if you could speak to how you process and deal with, with those little nagging thoughts of ambiguity and uncertainty. And sometimes in certain situations, perhaps in this one, it may become a bit overwhelming. And I was wondering if you could speak on, on that issue as a leader. Yeah, I think the first thing that you have to remember is you should not just don't spend time worrying about things you cannot control, right? There are all aspects of our everyday lives, whether we realize it consciously or not, that are out of our control. Um, and when people, it's funny, I used to get this question, I still get this question actually all the time. It's like, weren't you scared when you, you know, went into launch on this rocket and you went into space? Because it's so dangerous. And, and, uh, and my response was, no, I wasn't scared because it's what I really wanted to do. But also, you know, we trained for it. We, we understood the, we understand the environment. We built equipment to manage it. We built procedures to react to situations that could happen like a fire on the space station or a depressurization event where your air is leaking out, which is bad, of course. So we trained for it. And then beyond that, you just can't worry about things that you cannot control. And so you gather all the information that you possibly can. You get uh, you, you understand what you can control about the situation and you've just simply got to let the rest go because it's a waste of your energy. So for example, in this environment, 
you, we have some guidelines on how we should be living right now. Wash your hands a lot. Don't touch your face so much. Stay six feet away from people. You know, wear a mask if you, if you think you have a cough or if you're uncertain, wear a mask in public. And so these are the things that you can do to control your environment at the moment. Everything else, how long this is gonna last? Out of our control, right? Um, and so I would encourage you not to, to, to worry about those things. Worry about the things that you can, you can control, right? That's, that's really, I think, the best advice I can give you. Thank you. Even when dealing with a time of uncertainty and ambiguity and perhaps elevated stress such as this, people will form certain memories and many of those memories will be happy memories. Can you tell us about some of your favorite memories from your space missions? Oh gosh, there's so many because it was such a unique experience, right? Um, my first mission, uh, STS-112, when we arrived, one of my really good friends in the office, one of my classmates, Peggy Whitson, was on board. And so one night after everybody was sleeping, we hung out at the, U the, the lab, win the U.S. laboratory has a window that faces down to the earth. And so we turned on some music and we hung out for an hour and a half, which is one revolution around the planet, uh, and just watched the world go by, listened to music and chatted. So it was really wonderful to be able to share that experience with a good friend. And then on my last mission, uh, the cupola had arrived at the space station. It was, it's a module for many of you who aren't familiar with the station. It's sort of like our window on the world. It's basically a, a eight or nine, 10 sided uh, window uh, module. So you could, instead of looking through a porthole where you have your peripheral vision sort of limited by the structure, you could actually go into the cupola and, and see a, a 360 degree view of the earth and also because of the way it's uh, oriented, you'd look through the, what essentially to you looks like a ceiling and you'd see the earth there as well. So it's a beautiful, all encompassing, immersive view of the planet. And so on the last mission I was up there when the cupola was there as well, after everybody went to bed, all of my compatriots, I would spend a couple hours in the cupola just watching the world go by. So I essentially had the space station to myself and, and had the whole, you know, the whole earth to myself, if you will. It was really peaceful. That was really lovely as well. That's amazing. Um, another question about, about your missions. Um, again, right, we're being, um, as a society now, throwing a few curveballs and changing timelines and having to adapt and process and respond to that. Was there ever a mission that you were on that had an unexpected timeline change? And how did you have to deal with delays or extensions or, or maybe uh, some, right, some hurriedness to your, to your mission or schedule? Oh gosh, there are all kinds of things that, that changed. Um, one big one that you're more, more pertinent to this question was when I was originally assigned to my space station mission, it was only supposed to be around three months long. It was in, you know, basically a shuttle took me up and a shuttle was bringing me back. And so I was staying in the interlude. And so I was almost done with my mission. I was probably about a month away from the end of my mission and uh, got a call one day that said, hey, you know, we're gonna delay the shuttle launch to come get you because we're having some problems with the engines. And we have to sort this out, of course, clearly, before they felt safe launching the shuttle. And so for about a month or so, plus or minus a little bit, uh, I was on a week to week um, uncertainty about when I was coming home. And they'd, sleep, they'd say, I'd call down and say, oh, no, it's going to take another week to fix the problem. Oh, it's going to take another week to fix the problem. This kept going on for about a month or so. And it was interesting because um, at the end of March, if they wouldn't have gotten the shuttle launched by the end of March, uh, there was a Soyuz launch scheduled out of Russia. And there, there was a rule at the time uh, that they didn't want two vehicles arriving and leaving at the same time. So if they wouldn't have gotten the shuttle launch before the end of March, I was probably going to end up being there for at least another month, maybe a little bit longer. And so for a, a period of time there, I was not really sure how long I was going to be on the space station. And it wasn't clear how that decision was going to get made or, or if it was going to be you know, a matter of another week or two or one or two months. And so there was a lot of uncertainty around that. And again, it, it, first of all, I was in space. So who wants to come home from space? So that was one thing. <laughs> I was having a good time. But, you know, part of me was ready to come home because I finished the major parts of the mission that I, that I had been charged to do. And for a little while there, the, space, the control room was having a hard time scheduling us because of this uncertainty about 
or do we have to prep for the shuttle fly arrival or, or what? So things were a little bit less busy, if you will, you know? And so I, um, I, but again, I go back to that mindset worry, you know, there was no reason to stress about it because I had no control over the situation. You know, I wasn't going anywhere and um, it was going to be what it was going to be. And so I, I really didn't feel a stressed out or anything about it because it, I mean, it's just the situation, right? What you, you can't worry about things you can't control. And um you know, during the course of the mission, especially living in space for four and a half months, there's always something that go, that's going wrong. I remember one day I was opening up one of the European payloads, and as I was releasing the, the screw, I ended up stripping the threads. And so, of course, that took the whole payload down because we couldn't get it open with the threads uh, stripped. And so it took about a month for Mission Control to figure out how to uh, you know, we had to drill it out and you had to drill it in a way that you don't get metal shavings all over the place and get people's eyes. It was kind of complicated. But anyway, you know, I felt really bad about that because here, I, you know, my mistake took down a whole payload. But hey, you know, I didn't do it on purpose. It was an honest mistake. And we're just going to fix it. Right. I mean, you just have to really work hard. And it's, it takes work. But you have to really work hard about not stressing yourself out about things you cannot control. Thank you. Um, one experience that we are all going to have in common is right um, a re reentry and reintegration reintegr into a sort of familiar everyday routines, right? Sort of rebooting, and of course you've experienced this in a very unique way that that few others have. Can you tell us about what it was like to come back to Earth and 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 fold back into uh, a regular routine after being in space for so long? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that I noticed after my first mission, which was, you know, 10, 11, 12 days, you can, you can look it up, but um, my parent, you know, we land and we go through all these procedures to do medical and talk to the press and take a shower, which is awesome. And, and then my parents were taking me to dinner that night at Cape Canaveral. So they picked me up at, at NASA and we were driving down the main thoroughfare to go to the restaurant and I'm looking around and it struck me really kind of all of a sudden, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> how noisy it was. And I don't mean just orally, but visually it was crowded. There was all these neon signs and lots of traffic and lots of people. It was just, it was almost a moment of, of sensory overload, you know, cause I was used to a very small, <laughs> small environment. And so that was an interesting perception shift on, you know, just being in what I would consider my normal environment. But what I found actually each time I went back and forth to space, as you mentioned, I did it three times, was my body adapted and remembered and I adapted and remembered. So I became a creature of two worlds really. When I got to orbit, my body's going, oh, okay. You know, I know this environment, I know how to operate, this is what's gonna be. And then you come home like, oh, gravity. Yeah, back there, I can adjust to it. So I think the lesson is that we're all actually very adaptable as human beings and you don't realize it, but Many of you have probably already adapted into the environment that you're currently existing in that, that maybe if you think back to where you were a month ago, uh, you've sort of absorbed this as your norm and you've got routines, hopefully. And, and when we go out of this, I think, Steve, the, the really interesting question I have is not really how difficult it is for people to then go back to normal, but rather what is the definition of normal at that point, right? Because everybody's learning different ways of interacting, learning different ways of working, learning different ways of um, just doing normal life stuff. And I think we'll end up as a society and as a planet taking some of those lessons into whatever is our new normal. So that to me is a really interesting question. Yeah, I would agree. And, and right, in fact, all of, right, all domains of sort of society are having that conversation right now. And that is a particularly relevant conversation in higher education right now. And right, what the first question is, what does the post COVID-19 era look like for higher education? And then another question a bit more operational is, how do we fold back into whatever the new normal will be for higher education? So that's a fascinating conversation happening in frankly every, every corner and facet of society as we know it. Yeah. We're getting a lot of questions about 
your inspiration to become an astronaut and your training to become an astronaut. And I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So I was in middle school. I grew up in Belva, Illinois. So I'm just, you know, right up the road from you guys. One of the reasons why I came down to Rolla to school was I, I really liked the the emphasis on science and engineering. Um, well, science really, I didn't know what engineering was at the time, but, and it was uh, a nice size school. I love the size of the school. It's, it's big enough to have a lot of diversity and it's small enough that you don't get lost in the crowds, right? Um, but anyway, so I decided in middle school, I wanted to be an astronaut. And I was a little self-conscious about it because, you know, I'm a small girl growing up in a small town in, in Southern Illinois. Why do I think I should ever get to do such a thing? But I decided, at the end of the day, I decided to go for it right? Because if you have a dream, you really need to go for it. And I, I'm 55 now, and I didn't want to look back on my life and, and ask myself, the, what if I would have tried to be an astronaut? I wonder if I could have made it. You know, I didn't want to have that life. I wanted to try it. And so I decided to study physics because that was really the only thing I knew. I had no exposure to engineering prior to coming to Rawa. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to and, you know, I, I planned in high school, I was like, right, I'm going to study physics, I'm going to do all my science classes in high school, I'm going to go to college, I'm going to do physics all the way through my PhD, I'm going to apply to NASA, it's going to be awesome. And, and the idea of being an astronaut, I think, captured my imagination because um, I like science and math, I, I love the, that field, the problem solving is just so interesting. And the idea of, I mean, who doesn't want to go into space and be on the edge of what what you can do as a, as a person and as a technology and as a society and push that boundary of experience of, of human beings outward. You know, that, that all caught my imagination. So I came down to Rala and uh, studied physics, loved it, got a great education. But while I was at Rala, I discovered engineering. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting. You know, you take the physics and you do stuff with it. Awesome. And I got really intrigued with electrical engineering because I always, I immediately saw that my skill sets, if you were, were more on the electromagnetics uh, kind of the house rather than the mechanical side of the house. I, I really didn't like statics and dynamics at all. Sorry, all you mechanical engineers out there. But um, so I decided also at the end of four years, I'm like, ah, you know, I think I'm ready to go get a job for a while and see what the real world is like. And I can do my master's at night school. And so I ended up going to McDonnell Douglas and doing applied electromagnetics, which is what stealth, uh, stealth is and doing my electrical engineering master's at night school through the Raleigh Extension Center in St. Louis. And while I was on the A12 program, I got really interested in material science because that was a field I had not run into before either. And I thought, well, that would be the good thing to go do my PhD in. And so then I went to tech and, and did that. So I guess the, the, I got excited about uh, being an astronaut because I wanted to go into space. I took the path through physics because that was all I knew. And then I expanded my path as I went along because as I kept learning new things that were interesting to me, I continued to explore those interests. And then by the time I got my, my PhD, I had some work experience and I had finished my education and it's like, ah, hey, now's the time to apply. So I'll apply and see what happens. And that's really kind of the whole story in a nutshell of, of why I did it and how I did it. And, and there you go. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, Another uh, theme uh, among the many questions we're receiving is um, what advice might you have for someone, and this is maybe a two-part question or has two slightly different answers, what advice would you have for someone who may be interested in a career in space exploration and alternatively uh, advice for someone who may want to pursue a career in government with an engineering focus or background? Ah, okay. So with a, there's a lot of opportunities, and, and space exploration is a broad, a broad field, right? It's not just necessarily human, but there's also stuff that JPL and and does, and there's stuff um, that the satellite people do. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So really, there's a huge amount of opportunity, especially right now, in in the field of space. So look for opportunities to intern at, at different companies and. And even if you're interested in the government work, still look for opportunities to intern. And, and if you, you, know, you don't have to intern at NASA to get space experience, there's all the contractor base and the subcontractor base. Use your professors to help you find those opportunities. Use your professional societies to help you find those opportunities. Um, there's no shortage of uh, jobs and things that need, to need, that need to get done, but getting some, you know, some internships or some kind of hands-on experience 
is definitely a good way to get your, your toe in the water. Now, as far as the government side, <clears throat> excuse me, as far as the government side, there's a lot of different ways to work for the government. You can come straight in as a new hire. Uh, a lot of people, if, they, if the, there's not enough government billets, because the government does kind of restrict the number of people that they hire. They have a budget too, believe it or not. Um, but there are other opportunities working for a contractor, a subcontractor, and then transferring into the civil servant at appropriate times. There is work going on in aerospace all over the country at all different kinds of levels. There's the big companies that, of course, you probably are very aware of, you know, Boeing, Lockheed, Raytheon, SpaceX, Harris. There's smaller companies that are sort of in the middle technical area, and there's a lot of subcontractors and entrepreneurial work going on in, in if you prefer that kind of environment. So there's no shortage of opportunities. But again, start talking to your professors, go to your professional society meetings and meet people from industry. The best thing that you can do as students is, is build your networks because it's really all about the networks. And this isn't something that you get trained on when you're in college, understanding the fact that, you know, if you start building your networks, you, that's how you're going to find jobs as you get older. So for example, when I was leading the AIAA, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, which is the professional society for the aerospace community, just like AICHE is for chem the chemical guys and ASME is for mechanical and ASCE is for civil, whether no matter what kind of an engineer or scientist you are, join your professional network, go to those conferences and just start introduce meet people, go meet people, go ask people to help, go to a conference and, and talk to some of the attendees and say, hey, I'm a student and I'm interested in ex space exploration and specifically I'm interested in propulsion. And I would, you know, would you be able to answer some questions for me about this topic, right? And they are happy. When I was at AIAA, I mean, the, the, the professional attendees loved to talk to students, loved to talk to students. They were so excited to see students there. A lot of companies would come and recruit there. I mean, at our, our science and technology conference that we used to have in January, they still have it, but the science and technology conference in January, companies would show up and I know Lockheed showed up one day to hire 20 people and they hired 10 on the spot. I mean, offers that day, right? And so you need to get out and you need to start doing this kind of networking. And you don't go and you say, well, give me a job. You go say, hey, I'm interested in rocket propulsion. What are kind of opportunities are available? And now you've planted a seed in that person's head so they can go, oh, you know, I was talking to this, this young student the other day and they were interested in, you know, so-and-so over here, you need to talk to the student because they may be able to fit your, fit your need. And that's how the network works. And I found that it was interesting when I saw the community that I could probably find anybody in the community through two degrees of separation and had nothing to do with the fact that I had been an astronaut, but everything to do with the fact that that's how connected the community is, right? And so start building your network, start going out there, asking questions, you know, present papers at some of these conferences and, and just get out there and, and get around. That's really, I think the best way for you to figure out where are the opportunities that you might be interested in or learn about opportunities that sound that might be interesting for you that you don't know anything about yet, which is probably the case, quite frankly. Yeah. Thank you. So related to that question a little bit, you, you, you referenced talking to professors and, and, and using elements of your training and uh, in, at the university and, and some pieces actually really aren't that well developed at the university, such as as networker, right? There could be potential for more of that. But there's there's sort of two phenomena that are happening right now. One, uh, a social phenomena is perhaps a, a growing distrust or, or skepticism of the value of higher education, particularly public higher education. And uh, and now that is going to be exacerbated by um, right, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on economies, including state economies, that will have profound effects on public higher education. I was wondering if you could speak to your own personal philosophy about the value of public higher education and, and what, what trends or, or patterns do you see as arising in the quote, quote, post COVID-19 era of higher education? 
Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I went through public schools and uh, I did fine. I think I did okay. Um, I think it, it's like everything else. You get out of something what you put into it, right? I mean, I could have ended up at, I name, a, name a fancy private school, but if I wasn't willing to work hard and learn the material, it doesn't really matter where I go to school. Um, I think that there is uh, a financial, I mean, quite frankly, a financial model that's broke with higher education right now because states used to give a lot more funding to their public universities, and that's putting a lot of pressure on universities as those numbers have gone down. So that, I think, personally has to be addressed. That's a bigger problem than what we're talking about here. And for me, the interesting point will be now that you know, you guys are, are this grand experiment that got forced upon you with this distance learning, you know, what makes sense for students to do distance learning versus on campus? And how can that be crafted in a way to keep education more affordable for the students? Um, as well as provide the right balance of on campus, hands on social and, you know, engineering experience to round out an education. I think the, um, this, is, this, this experiment we're going through, I suspect, is going to be really stressing some of the old traditional models of how we, we teach, teach students. And even, I would argue, the ABET people, the accreditation people, are going to find this a little bit disruptive to their, uh, I would say, stodgy uh, model with affection, because I you know, was, uh, had a string into ABET when I was at AIAA. But, you know, the... The students, I find uh, from my times at AIAA, the students are demanding a little bit of a different teaching style and the system hasn't really been responding to that as, as quickly as one would hope. For example, when I was going back and forth, I did a lot with Georgia Tech, uh, talking to students and, and of course all the other aerospace departments around the country, I was talking to students. And I found a lot of them were very much engaged in these uh, cross-disciplinary hands-on projects. And by the way, RALA had, at Missouri University of Science and Technology, so I'll call you guys RALA, sorry. You guys, I think, are really one of the top universities in the country with the depth and the breadth and the ease of access to the students for these multidisciplinary cross-departmental cross projects that you have that are actually focused on building things and getting hands-on stuff. The Student Design Center there is spectacular. And I think what I, you know, that's going to have to be a continuing uh, emphasis, I think, of universities that want to stay pertinent and, and, and relevant. And that, unfortunately, you can't distance learn, right? And so it really, when you think about what makes sense to distance learn and what makes sense to be on campus, those are some of the things you're going to have to balance. But I find, again, that some of these, some of the students that I've talked to are doing a lot of these projects, like the, the, the Student Design Center projects, in their curricula, they're either more narrowly focused inside their major or they're more like after school extracurricular stuff and so some students are extending their time when they can by a semester or a year in order to get those experiences because that's what they perceive to be the most valuable and so you, I, I can only imagine the kind of conversations that higher education is going to have coming out of this because um, you know these are some of the dynamics and I think it, it, learning intelligently what you can do distance and what you can do on campus to keep the, the cost down and then maximizing those kind of cross-disciplinary uh, uh, facets of education, I think are going to be the keys personally. But I'm speaking as a complete outsider, so let me just carry no, on that. You, you've absolutely hit it right on the button. Yeah. You, you, you're seeing the, the issue very, very clearly, and these are exactly the conversations that uh, our campus and our university system and, and frankly the entire higher education community is having right now on practically a daily even hourly basis. Yeah. We're getting a lot of questions about um, the, the, the physiological and, and, and mental challenges that are imposed by space travel. And I was wondering if you could speak to those. You know, we, some of the challenges, of course, are lack of sunlight, uh, obviously, uh, weightlessness. And I was wondering if you could speak to how, how you were either trained or just on an impromptu basis, develop ways of, of dealing with these challenges. Yeah, so physiologically, your body does change. And one of the things, the prime things that we do to to mitigate the changes that we might experience in microgravity is exercise. We found over the years that if you, if you exercise pretty religiously following the prescriptions that they, they have, 
you really don't have a lot, uh, any, quite frankly, I came back after four and a half months with no bone or muscle loss. So the, so that the physiological, some of the bigger physiological changes we can, can, we can manage with exercise. Um, however, we're still learning things, right? There's a, 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 an issue that came up towards the end of my career. Uh, they started, the docs started noticing that people who had been staying months and months, and not everybody, but only some people who had been staying months and months in space, came back with permanent eye change. So, you know, where they might have been, had 20-20 vision, all of a sudden they're, they're, uh, there was a requirement to wear glasses to see distance. And so that was very perplexing. So because we had never experienced that with short missions, you know, all those decades of flying the shuttle. And so it turns out that that does indeed happen. It doesn't happen to everybody. And sometimes when you come back, your, your eyes readjust to normal and sometimes they don't and some people have no change. And so this uh, interocular pressure problem is very much a key study area right now as they try and understand what the heck is going on. There's some thoughts that because, you know, our microgravity, we all know that there's a fluid shift. And so we get a lot of fluid kind of in the, the center of our body. And if you look at astronauts who get on uh, orbit right away, their faces are kind of puffy because there's a lot of fluid even, you know, centering mm -hmm. in, their, in their brain area, their skull area. And what that tells your brain is like, hey, I've got too much food in my body. We find that we are end up, we, we uh, urinate a lot. I mean, we shed fluid in the first couple of days. Um, Consequently, before I returned every time, I had to drink a lot of water uh, and with some electrolytes in it to, to refresh my fluids so I wouldn't, you know, fall over <laughs> with, because of orthostatic pressure issues when I got back. But so, so they're thinking that some of that fluid shift may be building up pressure on the back of the eye and, and causing some of these changes, if you will, in the shape of, of the eyeball. So we'll start learning things like that. Our immune system depresses in space. We don't know why. Um, still trying to figure that out. So there's a lot we're still learning about the physiological changes, which is of course why we're, we're doing the experimentation. Um, from a microgravity viewpoint, it's interesting. We can't really train on the ground for a microgravity environment. We can do one thing, I'm sure you guys have heard of the Vomit Comet, which is an airplane that kind of does parabolas uh, in, uh, over and over again, about 40 of them after over in about an hour and a half. And so at the top of the parabola, as you're getting ready to, to fly over the top and go down, you have about, 20 seconds of microgravity. And so you, you can sort of feel what it's like to float briefly. But the, the dangerous part is, of course, as you come over the top of the parabola and you go to the bottom, then you go from basically microgravity to two times gravity. And so it's, it's sort of a brutal training regime because you're going zero G, two G, zero G, two G, and you're doing that for a couple hours. Um, so it gives you a little bit of a feel what it's like to move around in microgravity, but you really understand it when you have to live in it. And it's a completely different environment and you have to really um, sort of relax. I remember my first mission, I got out of the, I floated out of the, the mission specialist two chair I was in and I had to float to the F flight deck to open the Pale Bay doors. And I was back there and I was really struggling and trying to figure out how to do this. And I realized, I was like, why is this so hard? And I realized I was trying to stand up. Well, there's no such thing as standing up without gravity. And so I had to sort of mentally just stop myself and, and just, Okay, relax, you can float, it's good, no problem, right? But after even a day, it feels very natural. And what really happens is you understand Newton's laws at a whole new level because you're living Newton's laws. It's a perfect physics classroom. You know, the, the whole body in motion tends to go in motion until you're acted on by an external object. Well, usually that external object was a wall that you just ran into, right? The, the idea of inertia, and a center of mass, oh my gosh, I, I had to move a treadmill one day and it, basically the treadmill was about the, the same mass as my, my body. And so of course you carry things between your knees because um, you're using your hands to move around. So you learn how to you know, push off from the wall and float across the cabin and you know, grab another handrail and change your, your vector and so forth. Well, I pushed off the wall like I had done a hundred times before, but because I had a mass almost equal to my body mass between my legs, it basically changed my center of mass. And so expecting to translate, I rotated because the physics, you know, it was all messed up. And, and it was really a lot eye-opening moment. It's like, oh, I get it, you know? And, and so you find yourself sort of internalizing Newton's laws while you're, while you're living up there and, and it becomes normal. From a mental viewpoint, again, you know, 
I'm going into space. I've got a mission to do. I'm gonna, that mission's gonna be 10 days. That mission's gonna be four and a half months. That mission's gonna be a year. Whatever it is, you're sort of, you're sort of in a mental, a mental place where that's just gonna be your normal life. And it's, you, you, you adjust to it. You adapt to it pretty quickly. So another question we've gotten here, and it's a fascinating question, and it again sort of draws a parallel to your experience and, and what's happening now, right? There's many people who are worried uh, about themselves and their loved ones in, in, in terms of mortality, to be perfectly honest. Were you ever afraid or did that ever cross your mind during your missions given the, the Challenger and Columbia accidents? And did, you know, did those thoughts ever cross your mind and how did you process them? Yeah, so no, they didn't, because it was a choice I was making to go into space. And it was something I always wanted to do. And I sort of adapted this philosophy that, you know, none of us, none of us, COVID, not COVID, whatever, nobody on this call or anywhere on this planet knows how long they're going to live. You have no idea. You could be sitting in your house worried about COVID and your roof caves in on you right? Who saw that coming? So you can't, you know, you really can't live your life worried about things like that. Because it's, you have no idea, you can't control it. You when your time's up, your time is up. And yeah, it sucks. But that's the way it is, right? So I kind of took the approach that I want to live my life the way I want to live my life. And I have this dream to go into space. And yeah, okay, the, it could blow up. The, 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 you know, I could totally it could totally blow up on me while I'm going up, but I'm doing exactly the thing that I want to do. And I felt bad because, you know, if, if I was on the shuttle and we were launching and the shuttle blew up, you know, my problems are over, right? I have no more problems. But, I, I, you know, it's, it's harder on the families because they still have to live with the aftermath, you know? And, and so it's really, it's a lot harder on the families because I'm controlling the decision. I made the decision and I'm okay with it because this is what I want to do. Whereas the families are kind of along for the ride and they're not in control. And that's what makes this environment for people so stressful. And they worry about this, this aspect because there's, you know, you, it's really in your face that you don't have any control here. I mean, all you can do is do the things that you're, that, that the, the, the health people tell you. He's like, you know, wear gloves, wear a mask, wash your hands, stay away from people. You know, so you're given some guidelines on how to control the environment around you. And anything beyond that, you cannot control. And you can't let that bother you. And, and the interesting perspective I will give you is you are not in control over a lot of things in your life that you just don't have on your, your conscious mind every day that are equally potentially is fatal, right? An example I use for people is, how many times are you driving around and the car in front of you is swerving because the person is texting while they're driving, right? Someone like that could easily run a red light and hit you tomorrow. What are you gonna do, never drive anywhere or never walk on a street again? And so, you, you know, you have to kind of put this in context of uh, there's all kinds of stuff around you all the time that's not in your control Control what you can, don't fret about the stuff that you can't, and just live the life that you want to live. And it really is that simple, although it's hard to get your mental state to that point, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So now I'm going to turn us 180 degrees on, uh, on that topic. And a lot of questions along, along this line. How has your career and experience as an astronaut in particular, and your travels in space, how has that potentially or actually added to the sort of quirkiness of your, your view on life? Um, you know, what, what really funny stories can you tell us about that? Someone asked, how do you respond to flat earthers? You are literally the most qualified person to speak to that issue. Um, just some of the funny stories and lighthearted, right, aspects of your career and the experiences. Well, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of really weird experiences. I mean, not just flying in space. I lived underwater in the Aquarius habitat for a week, you know, at, at, at doing dives in a, uh, a helmet. Um, I, you know, just 
flying and fl learning to fly jet airplanes and T-38s. I mean, I've had a lot of wacky experiences. So um, I think you'll find that as you have new experiences, it changes your perspective on yourself and it changes your perspective on life, right? Clearly going off the planet is a huge perceptive, perceptive, perception change. I think one of the things that we notice uh, right away when we look out the window is, hey, the earth is, it's all connected. It's one planet. And this COVID thing has been very interesting from that viewpoint because it's really obvious that it's all connected. Look how fast that moved around the planet, right? So it really gives you, I think it should get everybody appreciation of how interconnected we are on this planet. But you know, from a funny story viewpoint, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm really bad about stories. I think, you know, working in zero gravity is, is an interesting perspective change because you realize how biased our organisms are for gravity. So here's, for example, if you ever see an astronaut doing this, it means they've lost something, right? Because if you lose something, it doesn't fall to the floor because there's no gravity. And so you have to really reset your mind. Uh, and, and one of my colleagues commented, you know, say you put a, you, you have a pen and you put the pen on the wall and it's in this orientation, you know, and then you float off and then you come back and maybe instead of, you're maybe not in this orientation, maybe you've rotated yourself, you know, 75 degrees and the pen is sitting here like this and you're looking for the pen right here because that's where you left it with respect to your body position and when you're in gravity, that's always the same. But on orbit, you know, it's really easy to uh, lose things that way because you're so used to working in a fixed reference frame and now you're in a reference frame that's constantly changing and there are a couple times when I was flying from one module to the other there's a couple of nodes on the space station where you can go to a bunch of different uh, different places you know it's like seven or six um, six different ways to go and it's really easy to lose track of wait where's the module I'm looking for because they all look the same because you have no reference point anymore and uh, and that's kind of funny, you're sort of lost in such a small space. But it's, it, you know, it happens because we, we are aligned to gravity. We are used to, to feeling uh, this, this force. Actually, you're not used to feeling it. You don't know what it feels like. You've never been out of it. But um, it's, you're used to kind of operating in this constant force and you don't even realize it. And it's really interesting to be able to, to be out of that and then kind of look back and go, huh, I never thought about things like that. Yeah. Right. Um, again, along these lines are the funny, quirky perspectives that one might gain from such a unique experience. Um, do you have any problem with suspension of disbelief when you watch sci-fi movies? <laughs> no, because they're movies. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know some people like, you know, Armageddon, they launch two shuttles right on top of each other. It's like, that never happens. Like, people, it's a movie, you know? <laughs> I will tell you that when I saw the movie Gravity, you know, they had these kind of scenes in the background, like what you see behind me. They did great graphics in the movie Gravity. I went to see it a second time just to go to a big IMAX theater and watch the world go by in the background because the graphics were awesome. But yeah, they tried, they started, they, they tried a little bit to, to replicate what it's like in space and they did really well in some areas and they failed miserably, I mean, almost annoyingly in others. And I think I was more annoyed there because they actually made an attempt earlier in the movie. And then in that one plot line where George Clooney had to leave, that was totally not real. And I got really annoyed. It's like, you guys were trying. You were really trying. And then, and then this happened. What? Got it. Yeah. Got so it. No, but normally it's like, it's a movie. Great. So uh, another question or sort of theme of the questions we're getting is, sort of forward-looking and hopefulness and an acknowledgement that ultimately we are going to find equilibrium in, in many, many ways and the path forward will be long and the path forward will ultimately be prosperous and, and will ultimately be right, have full of meaning and hope. And one question that sort of aligns with that, right? Knowing that the future is going to come and, and things we've always wanted to do, we're still going to want to do. Can you tell us about your perspective on uh, the uh, sending people, humans, on a mission to Mars? Do you think about that or have you been involved in any discussions on that or what's your, what's your basic thought? 
Oh yeah, I've, I've been involved in a lot of discussions on that and the debate continues. There's, there's a lot, there's, there's uh, several different camps on this, right? There are some people who um, think it's important to go to the moon and start a settlement on the moon first and then we would send people to Mars. There's people who want to go straight to Mars and forget the moon. Uh, just bypass the moon, you know, been there, done that, don't need it anymore. Um, the people who are generally proponents of going straight to Mars, their main worry is the fact that if we go to the moon and we do stuff there first, we'll get stuck there and we'll never get beyond the moon because we'll spend decades just doing stuff on the moon. The people who want to go to the moon first, of course, and I'm, I'm one of them, but I'll put a caveat on it in a moment. The, the people that want to go to the moon first um, <clears throat> are focused on settlements, right? Uh, but those of us who have a balanced view feel it's important to go to the moon to do sort of a, our testing, it's like kind of our testing ground, right? The moon's only three days away. So we can go to the moon and we can do some of the testing that we need to do there. We can't do on the space station. We're doing a lot of testing on the space station to get us to the point where we have closed loop life, closed loop life, life support and, and some of these other technologies that we really need to test out very, very thoroughly before you send people six months away because the moon is only three days away. So it's sort of like right now we're in our backyard and then we go to the moon across the street and then we can go to Mars and you know across the, across the ocean. And so going to the moon first to do some operational tests to bring out our technology makes a lot of sense. We don't have to settle there before we take that information and then we go to Mars. Um, the people who do want to settle there, we could argue that with this very recent interest, and by recent, I mean in the last decade, recent interest of industry in trying to engage in uh, uh, private enterprise in space, we could leverage that interest and build the infrastructure on the moon as we're doing our testing there as a government in order to build a, 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 an infrastructure such that private industry can kind of do stuff on the moon as the government pushes onto Mars, right? You think of that as an expanding bubble. So that's probably the right way to go do it. Um, currently, there's, a, there's a, a program to get people back to the moon. It's called the Artemis program. You've probably heard some of that. There's a goal of, of trying to do that by 2024, leveraging some of the systems that are already in development, including the space launch system and the Orion capsule and you know the stuff that Blue's starting to do and that SpaceX is starting to do. So there's a lot of activity going on right now. Yeah, you've uh, been in, really at an amazing time, right? And able, right, in being able to see two major evolutionary steps in, in space travel and exploration. The first being, right, uh, the globalization of space travel and exploration, right, and the, the international cooperation that, that really wasn't there at the beginning, right? It was the Russians and it was the United States and they were both doing their own thing. And then, right, in your era, you saw many, many countries, not just those two countries, but many countries come together on, um, right, on, in a collaborative way to tackle some of the most difficult problems and challenges related to space travel and exploration. And now, right, the second unique evolutionary step is the, the the merger and, and collaboration in and, and its privatization of, of space travel and exploration. And I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of perspective on those two, with, right, where you thought the benefits were and what sort of unintended um, consequences or pitfalls were experienced in both of those cases. Yeah, I mean, clearly international cooperation is, is the way that we're going to continue to explore. It's just, it's such a vast effort that doesn't make sense that any one country can do it on their own anymore, right? So those coalitions will, will continue to thrive. Um, and there's, you know, it's not easy, it, but it's worth it. You know, it took us a while to really get into a, a, a firm, gelled partnership on the International Space Station program, but I think it's, it's charting the way for how we want to go ahead. And of course, private industry now wants to come on board and, and do things on their own as well, although the business case isn't quite mature enough for that. There, that's very much still an evolutionary kind of startup function, right? But if you look at the bigger picture, it's really um, great that we've reached that point after 50 years in spaceflight where <clears throat> private industry is finally saying, hey, 
maybe there's something for us to do here outside of the, the realm of just the government. And, and you think about the fact that government investment is <clears throat> the leading edge for, some, for these kinds of massive undertakings because government doesn't have to make a profit. And so we can go as a government and we can uh, chart the course, develop the technology, develop the operational foundational knowledge, disseminate that technology, disseminate that foundational knowledge to the point where the risk is understood a little bit more for a private industry to come behind and take advantage of it. We are at that point. Now, as far as the unintended consequences go, you know, it's still, sending humans into space is still not simple. It's still fraught with peril. It's still not routine. And I kind of use the analog uh, analogous situation of people paying to climb Mount Everest, right? The experts went and they climbed Mount Everest and charted the course and figured out the paths and the techniques and the, the pitfalls, people died, you know? And, and so now there's commercial entities that lead, I would say novice climbers up Mount Everest and it's still dangerous and people still lose their lives. And, but there's a system that's kind of understood and managed there. And so we're kind of going into that era of human spaceflight where it's still dangerous. There will be people who lose their lives um, but there's a system to manage it and it advances everybody together. And, and one can argue that's why you want the government to do investment, to create you new, new sectors, new opportunities, new technologies for everybody else to come, come behind and then utilize. So I think that it's all good. You know, we're going to learn a lot. It's not going to be easy. We've got a bunch of bumps in the road ahead, but the trend, you know, the direction is good. It, you know. Mm -hmm. Another uh, series of questions we're getting relates to, to a theme, and that is you were um, a student athlete at Missouri s and UMR at the time, mm -hmm. and now you've had this incredible career that, that people wonder if there were certain parallels, in particular, uh, right, the essence of, of or premise of mental toughness, right? So uh, collegiate athletes are known for having this certain mental toughness, not just physical ability, but this mental toughness to remain focused when right uh, circumstances become a bit wobbly. And I was wondering if you could tell us whether or not there was a, a link between those two, right? The intercollegiate athletics experience and being a student athlete and your career and some of the skills you needed in your career. Oh, absolutely. I, um, first of all, I really appreciated the opportunity to be a collegiate athlete. My freshman year at Raleigh was when they started the varsity women's soccer program. So I got in on the ground floor, like literally. So, so much of my life has been at the right time, you know, right person at the right time. But yeah, mental toughness, um, team, you know, working on a team, uh, understanding how to pick yourself up when you make mistakes, because the team is counting on you to continue, even though inside you're sort of shriveling up going, oh, what was me? That was stupid. You know, and, and those kinds of things um, I really took from my athletic experience directly into my role as astronaut. You know, I mentioned the stripped bolt that I did on the European payload. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned in this, this one, this webinar or another, but, you know, I stripped the bolt when I was extract, trying to extract a European payload. And, you know, that was a huge mistake because now all these poor people who are trying to do science experiments were down for a month because, you know, I messed up on this bolt and, and I could have, I could have just kind of gone into a little huddle and had a pity party, but I couldn't because there was other things I had to do. People were counting on me. I had to carry on. I couldn't, you know, you just have to get past it, right? If you're mm -hmm. playing a soccer game and somebody just ran around you and scored a goal, okay, the game's not over. You still have to play and you're right. still, people right. are still counting on you to show up and be the defender, right? So, so mental toughness is, I think, um, a very valuable skill set and you don't have to be an athlete to develop mental toughness you just have to you know keep giving yourself a pep talk and realize hey we're all human we all make mistakes learn from it move on don't dwell on it it's in your past everything in your past is in your past you can't fix it you just have to kind of you know go forward and and i definitely that and you know the, the whole dynamics of being a part of a team the fact that you know maybe i'm not the best forward in the world and i can't dribble worth a crap but I'm a really good defender and I can affect the play there really strongly or the fact that I don't have the ball, the ball's on the left side of the field and I'm the right defender, but I'm going to make a run down the right side of the field because I'm drawing my forward with me and I'm affecting the play even if I never touch the ball. And so, you know, when you're on a team, you're affecting the team, whether or not you're the leader or whatever. And you learn these skills as an athlete and, 
and all of those were directly applicable to my role as an astronaut. That actually, oh, every, my you. everyday job, even now. Thank you so much. We're near the end of our time, and Dr. Magnus, I just want to thank you so much. This has been an incredibly helpful presentation for our students and everyone else who joined us today. Uh, we, we so appreciate your willing to willingness to share yourself with us, and um, we wish you nothing but the best in your role at the Pentagon, and we very much look forward to seeing you at s &T physically or virtually again very soon. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to come visit campus. It's just a matter of time. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, today's presentation was recorded and will be available next week on YouTube under Missouri S&T. Thank you all so much.